challenge for us today is that we're in this world where we're all starved for attention. And there's not enough attention to go around. Their emails are no longer fast enough. We, emails aren't enough, right? We have to have Blackberries. And Blackberries really aren't fast enough. We have to have instant messaging. And with instant messaging, we've got to keep doing it right back and forth. I have to put mine away. I'm not, I have two public hearings going on right now, and I really want to know what's going on. And there'll be 100 messages when I got done giving me a play-by-play. -play. And I don't really need a play-by-play -play because I can't do anything about the outcome. But we need it today. In today's economy, we have enough capital, we have enough labor, we have more information than we need, and we have more knowledge. They're all in plentiful supply. So it's sort of ironic that what we really need is attention because there was one point in, uh, in, 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 in my career where we looked upon a day when we could get all the information we wanted. Wouldn't that be amazing? If we could have all the information we needed at our fingertips. And I'm getting some blank looks over here because they're going, well, of course you get all the information you want. Well, wouldn't you? And now we have it, we don't have enough attention to pay to it. You know, so we, we have everything we need, but we don't have the attention. You know, creating a web page is easy. It's nothing to create a web page. Bandwidth is plentiful and it's pretty cheap. And even with all that, no one's going to be informed, no one's going to be persuaded, and no one's going to learn a thing from us with all that bandwidth, all those tools, all that information, unless they've got some free attention to devote for. And please note I said free attention, because it's not about time anymore, it's about attention. And it, it's not time management, it's attention management that we need to deal with. And that's what's in short supply. And it's really the, the currency of business today. Attention is our, our, our currency. And you think about it for a minute, it really is a currency. If you don't have it, you want it. If you have it, you want more. You can trade it, you can buy it. And we work to protect it. We work to protect it. So it is a currency. We're trying to protect it. Think about how much we protect it. What, what's one of the great, thing, the great things that are going on now is trying to block spam. I mean, block spam, you know, turn it up, turn it down. You know, my emails are getting bounced back to all my clients. Spam's too high, turn it down. I find out how that I'm not sufficient as a male. You know, 55 emails every hour <laughs> that I need certain tools for the rest of my life. And, you know, I get little riddles every hour. I mean, not really necessary. So we turn it back up, the emails go back to my clients. You know, internal emails that I send go to, go to spam. But you, we work to protect our attention. We have caller ID. You think about both sides of it. So for the first time ever, something like this works on both sides of the equation, that how do we get a hold of attention and keep someone's attention? And then on the other side is how do I control and parcel out my attention in a manner that protects me so I can pay attention to what I need? And those who answer that challenge will succeed. Those who won't will fail. It's that simple. I mean, if you can't figure out what to pay attention to, you're going to fail. If you can't get my attention and you're going to work for me or you work for me, you're going to fail. So understanding that probably is the biggest determination of success today. So we need to learn how to communicate to learn how to pay attention. And that's probably one of the great things, and there's a whole department at UCSB, there's departments and colleges all over. I happen to think the department here is one of the best because it talks about theory of communications. And you know, so many programs try to teach you how to do the tactics of communications, and the tactics are you know, pretty rote. They're just tools we can pull off the shelf. But the theory is what it's all about. But I think we talk so much more about communications then we understand what it is. And, and it's far more than what we say, it's how we say it. So, so many people spend so much of their time trying to figure out how to communicate and they never really understand what it is. And, and in the essence, it's talking so people will listen and listening so people will talk. And the fastest way to get your attention is what? To give you some attention, right? I just read this thing in uh, Seth Godin's new book called The Big Moo. By the way, his, his, uh, his website and his blog are just fascinating on communications. Don't agree with all of it, but it's good stuff. And there was a story, the, the Big Moo is 33 people from Tom Peters to uh, the Malcolm Goldwell that wrote the uh, Blink. And someone wrote, they don't say who wrote each of the essays, a real short essay, said, you know, I learned a lot about how to uh, how to deal with uh, customers and how to deal with communications from watching a sex therapist on the Oprah show. 
and the sex therapist came out and told me more than I've gotten at any business seminar. Came out and the sex therapist said, the this keep, secret to success is ask your partner what they want, give them what they want, ask them if they got what they wanted, and then if they said yes, continue to give that to them. And you know, in business, how we have to listen to our customers, we gotta, we gotta give them what they want, and we gotta keep getting feedback. We gotta keep dealing with them. And, in, and the reason that we have this issue is our society has become an information glut. And you look at past generations. We look at 20 years ago, 40 years ago, and they didn't have the attention problems that we have. They didn't have what it was. They, you know, they might have in, their, in the media for them, they might have three or four magazines. You know, that we had Look, Lifetime, and someone really adventurous might read Reader's Digest. And you think about what, what a difference in the world. And then TV, you know, how many channels of TV, you know, existed 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago? You have two, three channels of TV. And so, you know, today, you know, what do we have? We have a magazine for every issue. You know, we have every ability to get everything online. Digital TV, I mean, you can, you can spend all day just flipping through the channels, just see, counting the number of channels and what's on and what's going on. So you look at how much has changed, but if you look back to 30 or 40 years ago, I mean, how much more had happened during that time, too? If you think back in uh, past generations, you know, in the 1400s, the, the, the largest library in the world, the Queen's College, had 199 books. Francis Bacon said that complained there's not enough books. I mean, they didn't have an attention problem. They had an information problem. And we have the opposite. And this pesky geometric curve of information continues to grow. And so that hits us with an attention deficit economy. And we look at what it's done. We have a glut of information. We have too much information. And that glut means that attention becomes a scarce resource. And it's perishable. What is your name? Melissa. Melissa, could I have your attention yesterday? <laughs> sure, I'll try and get it back. <laughs> and it's, attention is like an airplane seat. Once a plane takes off, you can't sell that seat again. It's like fruit that rots in the grocery store. They can't sell it again. It's perishable. And so we only have a certain amount of time to get attention. And attention deficit culture or economy results in people being very distracted. Do any of you feel more distracted? You know, I think we all feel a little more distracted these days. And we're a little confused and there's a lot of anxiety. And what that leads to is we create instant impressions. Absolutely instant impressions. And there's a lot of distrust. And there's a tipping point to distrust that you can't see. I mean, you, and you guys all know that there's people you trust for a while and all of a sudden everyone doesn't trust them. And so where, where does attention come from? And I'll go through this pretty quickly. It's a take care of. It's a take care of something. So looking at it from a point of view from someone who's trying to earn attention for clients, we have a whole bunch of things that come into our awareness. A lot of things floating around that we see. A lot. And it doubles about every two years now. So, you know, what am I going to pay attention to? I see it, but what am I going to pay attention to? And there's a narrowing phase. And through this narrowing phase, we decide what we're going to pay attention to. And that's where we get to control whether people pay attention to us. And we go there, so, you know, what should I do with this information? Should I do something about this information? Is there something that should be done? Another phase called the decision phase. I'll, you know, should I take some action and do something about it? Because just getting someone's attention and them not doing something doesn't help you. It's like, okay, I'll do it. I'll do something. And for me, I try to look at what do I need to do to motivate people to get them to pay attention in that, that phase, that narrowing phase. So what are the different types of attention that we can deal with? First off, voluntary versus captive is a first pair. So voluntary attention is you're driving down the freeway and there's an accident on the side of the road. And you know, traffic slows down. What's wrong with those people? You wouldn't have slowed down and looked, but they did. So when you go by, you look. That's a voluntary use of your attention. You look at something. Voluntary attention is that we will look at things or pay attention to things that are even forbidden for us to look at. They're things that we want to look at. It's our choice. Captive attention is when someone has you in a class that you don't want to be in. Captive attention is when you're going down that same road after you got by the accident and you, you are speeding and you get pulled over and you go to traffic school and you got to sit there all day. 
but both type of tensions we have to deal with and we've got to figure out how to deal with. The next grouping is we, we pay attention to things that we're attracted to and we pay attention to things that we have an aversion to. So pretty simple, isn't it? Now this one is the one that's driving people crazy, I think, is we have front of mind attention and back of mind attention. Has anyone ever driven all the way home talking on the cell phone? And when you get home, you say, how did I get home? <laughs> and we do that all the time because you know how to drive home, but I can't go someplace that I've never gone before and talk on the phone and really have a conversation and drive there. But driving home, I don't have to think about where I'm going. So things that, people who have the ability to get things to the back of their mind attention are the people that are succeeding today because they have the ability to dual track. And people who have to have everything in the front of their mind, those are the people that you see walking down the street talking to themselves without a cell phone plugged in. Now seriously, that's where the anxiety and that's where people are going crazy. That's where people are really being overwhelmed by, by the whole flow of information today. So I'm, I'd look at this and say, how do I find out how to get someone's attention or how to get someone's, find their opinion? And we do a, a lot of public opinion polls and you know, quite frankly, why? Why do a poll when we get someone on the phone and get their captive attention and we ask them questions about something they may never pay attention to? And so there's a group called Capita Research who's been working with EEGs and they're trying to analyze the size, the shape, and the speed of the electrical activity in the cognitive section of your brain to find out what you pay attention to. You know, pretty hard to do that, to wire up a whole group of people to decide how to do it. But they call it the engagement index, and they're trying to find out the interest and involvement level that someone has with something. So one of the things they did, they tied, they wired up uh, physicians because, of course, part of the research has been paid for by pharmaceutical companies who want to figure out how to get our attention. And they sat there and they went through ideas, and one of the things, you know, they, they go on to say that they have worldwide experience and reputation for the pharmaceutical company, the doctors flatlined. But then they talk about the ease of instructions to patients of using the, the, uh, the drug. The doctors had rapt attention, obviously, because it's something that mattered to them. But imagine wiring up customers that we want to sell something to and finding out how exactly to engage with them. Now, I don't think that's that far off, because measuring public opinion doesn't really matter anymore, or customer's opinion, because if we know their opinion and they don't pay attention, it doesn't work. When, uh, when, when I was my uh, daughter's age, who's in, in third grade, they, uh, they started to wonder about me because I didn't say much because I had a horrible speech impediment. And, and when you have a speech impediment, what happens is no one understands you, so what do you do? You don't talk. And when I didn't talk, what do you think people thought? If you don't talk in a class as a kid, you don't respond, what do people think you are? You can go ahead and say it. What's that? Not very smart. Very nicely said. Not very smart. <laughs> this is a very polite audience. You were dumb. You're dumb. They think you're dumb. <laughs> As a matter of fact, they put me in the slow classes, they called them, because I was dumb. And the interesting thing is that I behaved that way. And then they sent me to a speech therapist when I was in fourth grade. And I learned how to speak. I could speak better, fifth grade, sixth grade. I got a little bit energetic about that I had the ability to communicate and uh, became a little bit, a little too enthusiastic about it and had to enjoy a couple rounds of eighth grade because I became one of the crazy kids that wouldn't stop talking and doing things in class. <laughs> it's, uh, but through that whole time period, I was communicating. I didn't say a word, yet I was communicating every day. And so, even though you're not saying a word, you're talking to the world, and that's what we're going to spend some time on today. And a lot of people think that great speakers are born. I mean, I surely wasn't born to speak. And how many, how many think great speakers are born or created? What do you think? Born? Created? I won't say a word no matter what I do. No one raise your hands. <laughs> I understand. But let, let's look at what I, I consider the anatomy of a great speaker great speaker, a powerful speaker. Number one, they're practiced and prepared. They're ready to go. Second, they're very aware of nonverbals. They're nonverbals, the audience is nonverbals, and they understand what's happening. 
they have a really great persuasive message. Now, some of you speak a lot, some of you teach, some of you listen a lot, and you, know, you meet a lot of people who have all these things and you still don't pay much attention to them because they're missing something. They're missing the most important element today as they speak and they don't have passion for what they do. And, you know, I've watched people that aren't really great speakers. They have great passion, and I listen to them. I pay attention to them. And people who have great passion can actually overcome the other problems. They really believe in what they, they, they are saying. Now, if they really believe in what they say and their eyes light up, their body's into what they're saying, everyone follows them. They listen to them. That's a great leader. And then if they're practiced, they're aware of nonverbals, they have a persuasive message, and they have passion, those are people that can change the world. There's... There's one person who I think is one of the great speakers in history, and uh, Martin Luther King. And the, Washington, the March on Washington in the 1960s, he's going there, he's in his 30s, early 30s, and the African American community is very nervous about this. This is a million people, it's going to be televised, and if you, if you push yourself back to that era, they weren't televising things like this. So you push yourself back to that era and think about what it meant. This is the main, major mo movement for them to change America, to change hearts and minds. Well, Martin Luther King was scripted. Perfect speech. He's a great speaker. Very, very, very good. And he was scripted. I'm going to show you a tape of it, uh, a clip of it, where he talks and does a speech that he was, he was uh, told to give, and then there'll be a little break and you see the speech he gave. And the speech he gave is the speech that, that changed America. of their captivity. But 100 years Watch, watch later, this guy. He's almost falling asleep on us. The Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. One hundred years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. One hundred years later, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his... He's a few minutes into this. He's already got a little beat going. But one day every valley shall be exalted. And every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain. And the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith. We will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day in his own land. I mean, the, the contrast is amazing. He was told what to say. He went off from his notes. He went from memory of a speech that he had given about a month and a half before in Tennessee. And he just, he went, he went to the heart. And that is, that, we don't remember the first part. And you saw the people behind him. I mean, they totally changed who they were and how they wa responded to what he was doing. Because he brought passion to it. And, that, and that's the key when, when you're trying to influence someone, to earn their attention is speaking with intention, speaking with passion, and letting people, letting people know that you believe in it. Now, a lot of times when people present something, I can't hear a thing they're saying because of how they're communicating to me non-verbally. And the perfect example is Al Gore and the, in, in the 2000 election. There was no reason for Al Gore to lose that election. And his nonverbals in the debates hurt him more than anything. And, you know, a quick example. 
Listen to the guy. Have a rebuttal here. Sure, but I just want to see if he if if he buys that. No, here's, let me just tell you what the facts are. The facts are, after my plan, the wealthiest of Americans pay more taxes than they, of the percentage of the whole than they do today. Secondly, if you're a family of four making $50,000 in Massachusetts, you get a 50% tax cut. Let me give you one example. The Strunk family in Allentown, Pennsylvania, I campaigned with them the other day. They make $51,000 combined income. They pay about $3,800 in taxes, and, or $3,500 in taxes. Under my plan, they get $1,800 of tax relief. Under Vice President Gore's plan, they give $145. I'm going to cut that short. Uh, after that debate, the public opinion survey voters of women who left Al Gore and went to undecided or to another candidate, the number one open-ended volunteer to answer why is he reminded me of my ex-husband. <laughs> I mean, the behavior of this and the, the huffing and puffing, I, wa I listened to this driving from Los Angeles to Santa Barbara on the radio. And then the commentators are saying how George Bush won the debate. Well, on the radio, George Bush lost the debate. And I was like, these guys are crazy. Again, the commentators get it wrong. And then I watched it on C-SPAN when I got home. And I, I, I now understood what the huffing and puffing and the breathing that I was hearing. I couldn't understand what it was. It was Al Gore. He lost that debate because of his nonverbal behavior. You think about that. I mean, you may lose a job. You may not advance. Al Gore lost the presidency in the United States because of how he behaved. And it didn't get any better. I mean, he, they got him under control. Then in the last debate, he did it again. He did a, he did a couple things that just made us uneven, uneasy. So where do these first impressions come from? You know, where, where does it happen? This is from the, uh, the famous Harvard study. Tone of voice. 38% comes from tone of voice. And, you know, I can't help you change your voice, but there are people, if you have a squeaky voice or if you have a bad rate, you talk too fast, you've got to learn how to control yourself. You know, talk too slow. <laughs> you know, and you think about it, when you talk to a baby who has no idea what you're saying, how you talk to him, the tone of your voice has more to do with anything. I have no idea what you're saying. You say to a little baby, you're such a cute little baby, we're just going to leave you up by the side of the door. And he's like, <laughs> And you say, you know, you say something rough. You're a great baby. You're going to be great. I'll give you a Porsche 16. Uh -huh. Same with dogs. You talk to a dog with a rough voice, saying nice things. A dog responds. We all respond to the tone of voice, to rate, to pitch. We respond to that. Here's, here's, a, here's an example of someone. If I'm poor and you're rich, and I can get you to defend me, that's good. But when the tables get turned, I'll do my share. Right now, we spend about $300 billion a year. I can't handle it anymore. <laughs> now, the big issue was that Ross Perot had big ears and we couldn't handle his big ears. I'm sorry, I don't have a problem with his ears. I mean, his voice had a huge impact on people. How he did it, we liked his message. The message is good. People liked what he said. We couldn't buy, the voice got in our way. We couldn't get by the voice to deal with him. Not only are we going to New Hampshire, Tom Larkin, we're going to South Carolina and Oklahoma and Arizona and North Dakota and New Mexico. Now, on this, none of you have seen this before. Because what you've seen is from the podium. Well, I watched it from the podium, and I watched it, and I watched it, and I watched it, and I said, why is that man sitting behind Howard Dean looking like he can't, he doesn't understand what's happening? He had this puzzled look on his face. Well, it was because he couldn't hear. Howard Dean was playing totally to the audience. And the, the media took the mic off the podium. Now, there's a lot of theories about whether that was done on purpose to take Howard Dean down. But if you hear from the audience, he totally played. Tom Harkin stood up and said, we're going to New Hampshire and we're going to pick this campaign up and we're going to win. You know, Dean stood up and fire, you hear the crowd and that's right by the stage, that camera. Think about 10 people back. But that cost him, that was the end of it. I mean, he was already in trouble, that was the end of it. The screen, did you hear the screen? Can you hear the little ear that he did that they played a hundred times? But his voice had an impact. So we got 38% from tone of voice. What do you think the next biggest, the next biggest area is? What's that? Nonverbal. Non yes. Did you think it was 
So 55% comes from how people read our nonverbals. So I don't know about you, I'd never walk into an audience and prepare that 93% of my preparation is for my nonverbals and my tone. You know, I would say that 93% or 100% is what I'm going to say. But as, as this attention deficit economy and culture continues, people are going to read things quickly and that's what happens. You gotta go to pictures. We, things that we used to write are now pictures. You, people no longer read and think, they watch and listen. They feel, they make quick decisions and you know, it's just getting more and more. Happy holidays to the all. I have to give Once you some nonverbals. Festive season. <laughs> Tonight our Jewish friends observe the fifth night of Hanukkah. <laughs> the celebration of a military victory won centuries ago in a part of the world where today 400,000 brave Americans await my order to annihilate Iraq. <laughs> I mean, that was a rap on him as his arms, his nonverbals. Remember, it's always, and it became, Dana Carvey has got to, got to go uh, as a top comedian because of how he played off it. But nonverbals, what are some of the nonverbals? And because I don't think I'm going to get to any of them today. <laughs> uh, what's the most important nonverbal, do you think? You guys, everything I'm going to talk about is common sense. John Wooden, I spent an evening with John Wooden because I bought it at, the, at a little event here with uh, Gary Cunningham and went down to spend an evening with him. And, you know, John Wooden's an amazing guy, but he tells a story. All the great basketball players come in. Bill Walton comes in. The first day of practice, he teaches them how to put on their socks and how to put on their shoes and how to tie their shoes. Now, these are the, the greatest recruits in high school basketball, and he's teaching them how to put on their socks and their shoes because... It's the basics that matter. If you have a wrinkle in your sock, you get a blister. If you get a blister, you're probably gonna miss a game or get, a, get injured and hurt yourself. If you don't know how to tie your shoe, your shoe can come undone at a key moment. You may have to sit down and tie it or you can trip and fall and get hurt. I mean, so basically what the basics, you know. So what are, what's the most important nonverbal you can think of? What, eye contact, yeah, eye contact. What's another one? Gestures. Gestures. Facial expressions, number two, smiles. Shoulder. With it, shoulder, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm trying to keep it back. <laughs> Working on it. <laughs> Feel like Walter Matthau as I get older. <laughs> Keeps getting lower and lower. So, you know, we gotta think about, think about those, and I'm gonna go through some real quick, I hope. So 7%'s verbal, and, and the, the key here is that they gotta be in concert. When what your tone of voice is, is different than your nonverbals or what you're saying, you know what we think? Something's wrong with this guy. And the reason we reject so many political people is because what they say is not what they believe, and therefore their body's not into it, and their tone of voice comes out different than what they're saying. And we go, you subconscious, we all have a little BS meter, and we're going, that guy's not who he says he is. Therefore, I need to reject him. But I believe in what he says. I don't like him. I mean, you, you go, no matter if you believe him, you won't like him. But let's not put it there. Let's put it in terms of the average family. What has happened to you? We find that your wages have gone up five times as much in the Eisenhower administration as they did in the Truman administration. What about the prices you pay? We find that the prices you pay went up five times as much in the Truman administration as they did in the Eisenhower administration. What's the net result of this? This means that the average family income went up 15% in the Eisenhower years as against 2% in the Truman years. Now, this is not standing still. When I ran for president, I said we cut the deficit in half in four years. We cut it by 60%. I said that our economic plan would produce 8 million jobs. We have 10.5 million new jobs. We're number one in autos again, record numbers of new small businesses. I mean, same message. <laughs> Same message, same exact message. One is a president running for re-election, Bill Clinton, with a smile on his face, happy, communicating. Richard Nixon looks like he's just he's coming into your house saying, you know, I just, I just ran down Fluffy. I'm so sorry, is this your dog? I got, he was Fluffy, I am so sorry. I was just going down the street fast and I ran over Fluffy. I mean, it looks like he's telling us that he just killed our dog, or it's the end of the world. But he's telling us all this good news about the economy. 
and everyone says that Richard Nixon's problem was he didn't shave on that debate. Does anyone care? Did anyone see? I mean, it's gray. How could there be a shaving problem when it's gray? <laughs> I'm sorry, the whole thing's gray. It's a gray wall behind him and a gray screen in black and white. I didn't, I mean, John Kennedy looked better, just that little clip, yeah. But what it was is a smile, John Kennedy's smile. Richard Nixon didn't know how to smile. And I believe that's one of the keys, nonverbals, is the ability to smile. And so many people, when you go into a room, if I do, I, when I do uh, media training with people, the first thing I do is I get you, either sitting or standing, to talk to me about something, oh my gosh, that you care about. And while you're doing that, you're, you, you're a little nervous at first, camera's going, and, but all of a sudden you come through and you're, you smile, your eyes dance, your head moves, everything's great. Then I ask you a question about something to deal with whatever, uh, you're running for office or your business or whatever, and you freeze, your smile goes away, your face gets totally flat. Well, that's a person I'm not gonna pay attention to. The person I'm gonna pay attention to is a person that is going to be as passionate about what they're telling me about their business or what they do as they are when they're talking about something they love. The person that your friends get to see is the person that I want to see. So what I'm going to do in about 10 minutes is about an hour worth of stuff. So I believe that our body talks people more than anything. So let's, let's go through a couple of them. The first one is pupils teach, which is obvious, is it, it's eyes and eye contact. So, you know, there's all sorts of studies, why are the eyes so compelling, and you probably could find someone here on campus that could give it to you, but, you know, a lot of people believe it's because it's, it's a direct connection to the brain, that people like to contact, there's a survival thing. Some people believe it's survival, that, that babies who survived, that our, our ancestors were the ones that made contact to get fed. I, I don't know what it is, that babies like little circles. You know, you put the little mobiles in front of, on top of a, a crib and babies stare at it. We don't know what it is, but we like eye contact. We like to see, we like to see people's eyes. And there's a lot of uh, neurons that are dedicated to uh, vision a lot more than that are dedicated to hearing or touch. So visual is very important to us. And the interesting thing is that what, what we like is we like it when people's eyes, their pupils dilate. When people's pupils dilate, why do you people, pupils dilate besides light? When do people, what do you think? Right, when you see something you like, you see something you really care about. There been studies done where they show groups of men and women, pictures, pictures of handsome men, beautiful women, you know, nature scenes, babies. Well, of course, men see the nature scene and say, that's really nice. They see the beautiful woman, their eyes, the pupils dilate. Women see a handsome man, their pupils dilate. They see the nature, not much. See the babies with a mother, their pupils dilate. Some famous studies on that. And we, our, we, our pupils dilate when we see something we like. And then the interesting thing is when, we, when I see your pupils dilate, don't you think I already know what, that you like me? We all know that. And so, you know, one of the things, if you watch, look at political uh, mailers, make their pupils bigger. And you don't think they do that. Make their pupils bigger, because we like people with bigger pupils, because they like us. And you're, if your pupils dilate when you like something, and we like people who like us, I mean, we all like people who like us. We, we go look for people who like us. So the, the gentleman that did the work, if you want to look at it, is Eckhart Hess. And he did it in the 70s, where a lot of this nonverbal research was done. Not a lot been done in the last 20 years, mostly done in the 70s. I could go through a whole bunch, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit. Uh, I was doing a crisis communications program for an oil company in Santa Maria about 10 years ago. And uh, got up in the morning, I didn't feel too good the night before. I got up in the morning, I was really sick. And so I, you know, I gotta give this thing all day all morning. So, you know, I got dressed, took a shower, said, okay, I'll be okay. I can work this out. Leave the hotel room, close the door, immediately feel sick. I go back in the room, clean up, sit down. And I sat down and I, I hypnotized myself a lot of times when I speak. So I hypnotized myself. And I said, I'm fine. I feel great. Thought about a moment when I felt really good. I faked my body into not being sick. And the deal is that actors and actresses do this all the time. They fake their body into emotions 
And, that's, and they get paid millions and millions of dollars. And, you know, they didn't get an extra gene. They didn't get something we all don't have. We just don't access that ability to control our emotions and our body through that. I did that seminar all morning, got done, we, we finished up, people left, I went into the bathroom and got sick. So I was able to control my body by, by giving my bo myself a body fake for four or five hours by that. And people do that all the time. So if I was to ask you right now to close your eyes and go to a time when you were very angry, and Catherine was very angry and very upset, and, and you went there and you did what you did at that moment, and you might scream. Yeah. And when you're angry, your whole body, your physiology, your body changes. And it would change now. They, they did a study at John Hopkins. They wired people and had them go and, and feel emotions they've had at another time. And they responded exactly the same. Their body did. The body doesn't know the difference. So if you're ready to go do a presentation, you're going to go do an interview, do you think that maybe when you're nervous, things don't go as well? It gets you, it gets you a little higher energy. But if you can get yourself to be able to sit down, do whatever you do, meditate, hypnotize yourself, just sit for a moment, take yourself to a place where you feel confident, get yourself focused 100%, you're going to do a lot better. Get yourself ready. Fake your body. Fake yourself into the moment. This is, always, this is always a tough one because sometimes I get oranges thrown at me from the women in the room. That, like George Bush, 41, people who move too much are not seen as leaders. They're not seen as much of, as a powerful leader or someone to follow. And you think about, you know, a cheetah for a minute, just about to leap and grab to someone. Or pray, they're totally still. And then they jump, and they're gone. And the average businessman comes into a meeting, sits down, and goes through about six motions after they sit at a table. The average woman goes through 17. Now, every motion after six means every man in the room says flake because she's moving too much. She's nervous. The person in the room that moves the least doesn't mean the, the, with the least m m crazy energy is the most powerful. I was in a meeting with about 50 Fortune, top Fortune 100 companies, the uh, top folks around the center of the table, the next group, <laughs> underlings around the next, which are probably only sen senior VP, and then another group, and they're sitting around this big table, it's a huge conference room, and the person that was in charge of the meeting didn't say, let's start. He went like this. We totally controlled the meeting. And when you think about it, people who have an economy of movement are people who are the leaders. Those are people that are looked at as leaders. We, we take our heroes and make them into people that have economy of movement. So you teach yourself how to move economically, with purpose, without a whole bunch of wasted moves. A great scene in Pretty Woman, where they're the, 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 the transition stage, they're walking out and down, and she's all dressed up, and he just gave her the necklace thing. And she turns from being a, a street woman to the pretty woman, is when he said, stop fidgeting. It takes away from your beauty. Stop fidgeting. So I'm actually very much in touch with my feminine side. So. I try not to fidget too much. And I just saw someone glance at the, at the wall. So I'm, go I'm going to do a couple more and then jump, jump ahead. So gestures are good. It's just unnecessary gestures, sitting down, you know, pulling down your dress, combing your hair, doing, doing makeup, pulling out something out of your purse, something out of your briefcase. Get it organized. Walk into the room. I try not to go into a room with a briefcase. What do I need a briefcase for? I bring in my file and my notebook and my pen, then I don't have to dig into anything. And I teach my staff to do that. We're ready to mow, we're ready to go. We don't go through a whole bunch of motions. Any of you in the military? Anyone military, ever? No? Who's that? No. Well, in the military, what, 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 is, what is the enlisted? They stand at attention. The total symmetry, totally symmetrical. And that's one of the least powerful ways to be. People who are, stand totally symmetrical are always subservient to those who are a little bit asymmetrical. It doesn't mean you lay down and are lackadaisical. But there's a little, a little bit of asymmetry to you when you stand or when you're meeting. So if someone comes in and you're sitting in an interview or sitting in a meeting and you're like this, 
makes us all a little nervous. Okay, do you want to campaign against Bush? No, 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 I want Go to you. New Hampshire. No. It's the perfect place for you. You're in the wrong state no, right you know now. What? Because otherwise it's so hypocritical it's for maybe you. Maybe a little bit more decaf. No, 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 you know what? Let me finish. Right Let me finish. You know, this is completely impolite. This is the way you treat women. We know that, but not now. <laughs> could spend a long time on that debate, the brilliance of Arnold Schwarzenegger in that debate, the picking on Ariana Huffington. It was a brilliant move and it was totally staged that he did that. But you notice his, his, one of the things, Arnold always has a little bit of uh, an asymmetrical pose. I mean, you got to look at someone who's a trained, trained actor, knows what he's doing, knows his body really well. And the way he was, you know, total different deal. You watch Al Gore and that earlier and he's, you know, he's all over the place moving and he's not asymmetrical. He's, so, a little, bit, a little bit of power from that. Someone yell at me if I need to stop. I'm going to skip this one because I could take an hour on this. We're very possession-oriented people. We, we, uh, we have this thing about where, where our body is versus other people. And, you know, in our society, that's a, that's a pretty funny thing, how we, we stand. So the, the greater public area that will be around someone is about 8 to 12 feet. So 8 to 12 feet away, we're in a geez, public setting, and we'll stay that far away. In a social setting, we'll get a little closer. We'll get 4 to 8 feet, we'll stand. In personal setting, we'll get you know 2 to 4 feet, we'll get there. And then intimate, we'll get like this. And how's that going for you? <laughs> How is that going for you right now? Fabulous. All right, are you having a little situation? No, everything's A little fine. hair on the back of your neck going? Yeah. <laughs> And so there's a, whole, there's a whole way that when we're close to people, not close to people, how, how, how we interact with them that way. And we have to be careful with that. So that, that's a little bit of, of uh, body room and turf, how you deal with turf. So if I'm negotiating with you on something, and where do I want to meet you? My office or your office? I'm negotiating with you. I want to meet in your office? Your it depends. It depends. If I want to intimidate you, I want you in my office. If I want to read your nonverbals, I want to go to your office. So you got to decide, which is sort of fun, because you go, okay, where do I? Can I go to someone's office and feel comfortable? Depends on whose office it is. Yeah, you know, some people set up offices so they intimidate you. But the interesting thing is, I'd rather be intimidated and have the other person relaxed, because when they're relaxed, I can read them better. Someone's really relaxed in their office. They tell you too much, don't they? They're, they're on their own turf. So how, how people play by their turf and how people take over other people's turf is really important. We did a, a, a campaign for Fess Parker here in the 80s. And he, you know, he's an actor, man. He could come into my office. He's careful about the turf, but he takes every turf as his. I'd get a phone call. It's John, it's Fess. I was wondering if I could come by sometime today to talk. Sure, fast. When would you like to come by? I'm in the parking lot. <laughs> okay, so you'd like to come by now? Yeah, that'd be okay with you. I mean, a little in your turf, but not totally. I mean, he's not in my face. Pretty close. Comes into the office, goes to the front desk, says, Hi, I'm Fess Parker. It's like the 50th time he's been there. Always gentle. And I was wondering if you could fax these things to my lawyer. And the name and everything's on there. You just got to put those cover sheet on it or something. And before you get John... I was wondering if you'd get me a little cup of coffee and maybe an orange juice. <laughs> you know, Fess took over my turf. <laughs> he, takes over, he took over every turf he came into. That was part of who he was. And so we have that ability to take over a turf in a gentle way. We always want to go to their turf. But if you want to intimidate someone and really make a point, you bring them to your turf. Or go to a neutral, neutral turf. All depends on what you want to get out of it. If I can get something positive done on behalf of the people. That's what the question in this campaign is about. It's not like what's your philosophy and what's your position on issues, but can you get things done? <laughs> and I believe I can. All right. What about the Denver Norwood bill? All right, we're going to go now. I'm not another. quite through. Let me finish. Right, yes, go. I talked about the principles and the issues that I think are important in a patient's bill of rights. You know, there's this. It's kind of Again, a nonverbal by Al Gore that made us all laugh, but it made us go, 
Do we want the President of the United States to come up to someone and behave like that? No. I mean, that was, and, and I'm going to show you the rebound on that in a second, I think. So, 8 to 12 public, 4 to 8 social, 2 to 4 personal, intimate. And, you know, some people say the reason we close our eyes when we kiss is because we can't handle the closeness that much. But that's even too much. Look at this one. But watch watch Bush learn from his... stem cells that he's made available, every scientist in the country will tell you, not adequate. Because they're contaminated by mouse cells, and because there aren't 60 or 70, there are only about 11 to 20 now, and there aren't enough to be able to do the research because they're contaminated. We've got to open up the possibilities of this research, and when I am president, I'm going to do it. Because we have to. Did you notice Bush? I mean, he learned. I mean, he, I'm not the only one that saw what Al Gore did. He learned. And you see how he stopped himself? I mean, it's like he glued his feet. I, I, you know, Al Gore got in trouble for that. <clears throat> I just want to go punch him. <laughs> I want to punch him. I mean, he controlled himself, but he, he was ready to get into his face. And it just sends a bad message. Uh, we, we all leak our intentions. I'm sorry. Uh, we, we leak our intentions all the time. Men usually, one of the ways men leak is they tap their feet. And you know, I, I haven't watched anyone tapping much here, but pe men will tap their feet or they go like this. And then women come up to them. What do women do when men are tapping their feet? They talk faster and ask more. What do men do? They tap their feet more and they don't pay attention. Now, women are more likely to use their fingers. I'm in touch with my feminine side, so I use both. But, you know, I fidget with my hands a lot and, and move on. But what happens is someone, what, what should we do when someone, someone's telling us, I'm not paying attention to you? You're talking to someone, you're trying to get your point across, and it's not working. Do you want to keep talking? What do you do? What's the easiest thing to do? How do you get someone's attention? Ask a question. See, I told you. You put the socks on and make sure there's no wrinkles. Yeah. I mean, you ask a question. You stop and ask a question. And then what do they say? Huh? What did you say? And you mean, what did you say? I've been talking to you for 10 minutes. What do you mean, what did I say? I mean, and that's more and more and more today that you're trying to get someone's attention. So one of the things we do, we ask a lot of people a lot of questions. We make people think. We ask people questions in materials we send out. We ask people questions and we call them to try to persuade them to do something because we're trying to make them do something. And you have to vote for somebody with a plan. That's what you have elections for. Nice leak coming say, here. Well, he got elected to do this, and then the Congress says, okay, I'm going to do it. That's what the election was about. Brief, Governor Clinton. Thank you. <laughs> we have a question right here. Yes. How has national debt personally affected each of your lives? In the big cities, it's political patronage, stepping stones. It's unbelievable. President of the United States in a, in a public debate. I mean, it's not like he's got to go to dinner. <laughs> Did our administration push for the total training of Iraq? No. Were they silent? Yes. Was there an effort to bring all the allies together around that? No. Because they've always wanted this to be an American effort. <laughs> Bill, do we break any laws if we go? I continue going for a minute. Uh, my opponent looked at the same. In Sir, have we moved far enough along that we no longer need to use race and gender? as a factor in school admissions and federal and state contracts and so on. Uh, no, Bob, regrettably, we have not moved far enough. You guys see that? Uh, my opponent looked at this. Let's, let, let's go back a little bit. I'm going to do the, we'll talk about listening a little bit. I was going to skip this. But how we listen with our body and how we nod, there's different types of nods. And today, when we're not listening to people, we nod in different ways. Because when we're not listening to someone, we're sending another message. So, you know, a little nod is, hmm. And some of you have been nodding to me. Oh, yes. You nod a lot. <laughs> you do. You don't even know it. But you do little nods to me, and you're nodding to me, saying, yeah, I agree with that. But it's not, I agree with that. He goes, I hear you. I hear you. I agree with you is a big nod. Yes, I agree with you. A lot of big nods is I'm not listening to you. <laughs> Please finish. And so if you're watching people, you're trying to get through to someone, and they're going like this, shut up. Just ask them a question again. So wh watch this. Uh, my opponent looked at the same intelligence I looked at and uh, declared in 2002 that Saddam Hussein was a grave threat. He also said in December of 2003 that anyone who doubts that the world is safer without Saddam Hussein does not have the judgment to be president. 
I agree with him. The world is better off without Saddam Hussein. Uh, Why would he do that? Why is he nodding in agreement? Now watch another one, which is amazing, because Kerry nods and nods and nods and then says no. And you go, so what, it, what was the whole campaign against Kerry? The campaign against Kerry is he flip-flops. And so he does one non-verbally for us. Sir, have we moved far enough along that we no longer need to use race and gender as a factor in school admissions and federal and state contracts and so on? Uh, no, Bob, regrettably, we have not moved far enough along. Uh... I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and he's, and then the, the rap against him, he's flip flopping. So everyone's like, you know, I think you, you listen to the page and you go, no, again, Kerry kicked his butt. And at the end, they do the thing and it's just a little victory. You go, well, how did that happen? Oh, we're going to have to go fast here. Okay, look at this fast. Okay, good. Instant impressions. You guys all got this. Um, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get through the last one on this. Uh, so, do you lift weights? Yes, I do. Come join me. <laughs> Catherine will hold your phone for you. Come on up. Are you left-handed, right-handed? Right-handed. Okay. Right-handed, so that means that this would be your left hand, right? That's correct. Okay, so I'll come over here. Okay, put your arm out just like this. Left or right? The left one. <laughs> Very specific. That's good. Okay, I'm going to push your hand down, okay. your whole arm down, and you're going to stop me, okay? Can you do that? Possibly. Okay, okay. <laughs> he lifts weights. Okay, very good. And what's your name? Andrew. Andrew. Okay, put your arm back up again. I'm going to push down again, but as, I'm, as we're doing this, I want you to say, my name is Andrew, my name is Andrew, my name is Andrew. Okay, keep saying your name is Andrew. Ready? My name is Andrew, my name is Andrew, my name is Andrew. Okay, now... We're going to do this again. Put your arm up. I want you to say, my name is Catherine, my name is Catherine, my name is Catherine. Okay, ready? My name is Catherine, my name is Catherine. Nice. Come on, come on, let's do it again. My name is Catherine. What happened? Now, do it again. Keep saying, my name is Catherine. My name is Catherine. Yeah, see? And do you notice when he stops talking, his arm stops. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. What, what it is, is that uh, the body never lies. I can look at a group of people and I know when they're lying to me. We all know when people are lying to us because the body never lies. Our eyes tell us we make less eye contact when someone's lying. Our a voice goes up a couple octaves. We shuffle our feet. We touch our nose. We do all sorts of crazy things when people are lying. So, yes. True. Okay, if you uh, look at the screens, you'll see his um, pulse is even, respiration normal, pupils undilated. Signs of the truth. Come on, rough me up, let's go. Rough me up. Have you ever worn women's clothing? <laughs> Who said that? Yes. True. <laughs> Were you uh, ever stationed in Peru? Yes. True. We can tell the body, the CIA uses this. They teach people, and this is you know, obviously out of their manual. I have a good friend who is an operative with the CIA. I mean, they teach you to look at eyes. They teach you to look at how people's bodies move, to whether they're telling the truth. And if you saw this, the recruit, you saw this movie, at the end, he gets right in the woman's, the other, the co-star's eyes and says, you know, you tell me if it's there. And he's looking, doesn't have the machine to tell the truth. So your eyes... The other thing is our nose itches. Our nose itches when we, when we tell a lie. A lot of people's nose itch, and they call it the Pinocchio effect. <laughs> that when you lie, your nose itches. So you watch people and they tell lies, they go like this a lot. It's sort of, but you can't do one person goes like this, he's got an itchy nose. I mean, you can't say he's lying. You know, this is one of the classics. The shoulder shrug, hands up, lie. The problem for some people is that's just what they do. Dan Quayle did this about 50 times a speech. Well, I don't know, I'm a hopeless liar. I'm a hopeless liar. I'm a hopeless liar. And you wonder why no one, I mean, think about Dan Quayle. What, his actions didn't match his words. The way he talked and the way he did things. And he's always doing this. You know, I catch my kids all the time. So, did you hit your sister? Her? No, no, she ran into the wall. <laughs> and they can't look you in the eye. 
I was a partner in a little ice cream business. I'd walk into the store. We'd have you know, a couple of people working. I'd walk in the store. I'd look them in the eye. I'd look them in the eye and said, she's stealing from me. <laughs> I'd go to the cash register. I'd run a report. There's three, three young boys drinking milkshakes. No milkshakes been run up, rung up in the last hour. How come there's no milkshakes run up? They're going to buy some other stuff maybe and you're just waiting? Yes, yes, that's it. I mean, people tell you all the time that they're lying. I don't think that's the right answer. I don't believe legalizing narcotics is the answer. I just don't believe that's the answer. I do believe um, that there's some fairly good news out there. The use of cocaine, for example, by teenagers is dramatically down. But we've got to keep fighting on this. Watch a blink ray. You in the eye and say I don't think that's. Sorry. Watch, watch his blink ray in the here. Eye and say to you, no, low blink ray. I defended this country as a young man in war, and I will defend it as president. That's of the his United normal States. blink ray. Now watch. Absolutely. Yes. When you lie, you blink more. Right into the camera. Yes. I am not going to raise taxes. I have a tax cut. And here's my tax cut. <laughs> so. You know, the rap that he wasn't going to defend the United States, that he didn't believe in that, was totally wrong. He believed in his heart he would, but on the taxes, he did not believe it. So believe it or not, we got through the body talk. Uh, let me end, even though we're way beyond, I'm sure Bill is having a fit back there, with one, one last tip that uh, I got from an unlikely source years ago. Is, as you know, in the summer, in August, the first weekend in August, Santa Barbara has fiesta or as they call it, old Spanish days, or as I call it, old white middle class days. Because <laughs> all the guys that are on the committee are white middle class guys. A lot of them are good old boys and waiting. And uh, you just see them, you know, the, you know, the guys that are 20 years old, you know, are going to be a good old boy someday. They just walk like But there's one place where fiesta still happens in this town, in the old Spanish days, at Our Lady of Guadalupe down on the Lower East Side. And the little old ladies of the church make incredible foods. And they have incredible dancing, and it's a great place. I was there. I don't know, about 10 years ago. And uh, I eat too much when I go there. And I was eating a sopa, which is you know, unbelievably homemade, greasy as possible. Sopa in my hand, and then I had this liquid in my other hand. It was, uh, it was like amber and had bubbles and white on top. <laughs> uh, bubbles, beer, yes. Yeah, and I was drinking that, and this little girl came over, all dressed in her Spanish dancing costume, and said to me, hey, mister, you want to buy a raffle ticket? They're three for a buck. So I put the soap uh, on top of the beer, like we all know how to do now. And I reached in my pocket and spilled grease all over my shorts that are still greasy. I mean, to this day, you wonder where, what my belly looks like, right? I pulled out the money. She gave me the ticket. I put the ticket in my pocket. I ate the soap, I drank the beer, had a big bowl of pozole, which is the greatest pozole in the world, had another beer. Had some other food, and finally I was ready to explode, and I was watching the dancing. And as I was watching the dancing, I did something that men do all the time. I reached into my pocket, because it's full of the dollar bills from buying stuff at the, the festival, and the, felt the ticket, and I put out, brought out the ticket. And there was something on the back of that ticket that I think is the most important thing to do when we're trying to communicate with people. And it said on the back, it said, you must be present to win. And I don't think we can do anything in our life if we're not present and we don't give it our full attention. We can't be successful in business. We can't be successful in relationships. We can't be successful as a friend, as a parent, as a spouse. We can't do anything unless we pay, we pay attention to people and we're present in mind, body, and soul. And I thank you for giving me so much attention.